And with that, I'm going to introduce you to our first speaker. We're very focused in Europe about European things, but you may have wondered who's holding the US to account. Well, the answer to that question is the man who is our first speaker. He is Mark Rottenberg. He is the EPIC president, which is the uh, to say he is the president of EPIC, which uh, brings court cases. Uh, he prides himself on getting sued every other week. And uh, he is also a professor at Georgetown in Washington. So Mark, please, your thoughts. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm speaking, yes? You can. I'm, I'm going to sit here and listen to you. Okay, well, um, thank you so much. I wanted to begin by thanking uh, the Nordic Privacy Arena for organizing this wonderful event and the opportunity to uh, see some friends again. Uh, also, I wanted to give a special uh, shout out to uh, Finn and the Norwegian uh, Consumer Council. Increasingly, uh, consumer groups and privacy groups in the U.S. are working more closely with our colleagues in the EU. Uh, we're very impressed by the work of the Norwegian Consumer Council. I would say that Finn is putting the R in recall for uh, Kayla and smart watches and many other products that are sometimes entering the mar marketplace a little bit too soon. But I'm here today to talk about my organization and the work that we've done recently in the United States. I am the president of uh, EPIC, which is the Electronic Privacy Information Center. And during the course of my talk, you'll be able to see on the screen a slideshow of some of the recent activities that we've been engaged in. I'll be talking about those uh, as well. Uh, our organization started 25 years ago with an ambition, I think, very similar to the Nordic uh, Privacy Arena. Our aim was to focus public attention on emerging privacy and civil liberties issues. And 25 years ago, we had a very interesting issue to consider, which was what should be the role of encryption in a democratic society? Because as the internet in the early 1990s emerged as a platform not only for communications, but for commerce and governance, there was a great debate taking place in the US and also in Europe about very robust techniques for privacy and security. In the US national uh, security community, our beloved NSA, if I may say that, uh, was concerned that people would have too much privacy. They said we need to build in techniques of backdoor access to private keys. We need to mandate something called the clipper chip which would ensure that no one could have a private communication without the ability of the government to decrypt that private communication. And so we drafted a short letter uh, to then President Clinton. It was signed by 42 experts, experts in law, experts in technology, experts in human rights. And we said to the president, we didn't think this was a very good proposal. Uh, we know people differ on the right to privacy. We believe it's a fundamental right. Others may have a different perspective. But we do think that the risks to our society, to the security and stability of the internet would be jeopardized if we could not ensure strong privacy protection. And we posted uh, this letter on our website. As I said, there were just 42 signatures at the time. And uh, 1993, I think. People wrote to us and they said, well, I don't quite understand what encryption is about, but this seems like a very important issue. Can you please add me to your uh, letter to the president? Uh, we did. And over the course of six weeks, we picked up about 50,000 signatures. We actually had the first internet uh, petition. And we printed it out in large uh, letters, by the way, so it would take up a lot of space when we had paper. 50,000 people on the internet, by the way, in those days, that was a lot of people. That was like half the internet. Now it's a Facebook group, I guess. But it was a lot back then. And. Um, the White House backed off and they said, uh, well, maybe you're right. Maybe we should find a different solution. And of course, we thought at the time we had won that battle against the uh, NSA. And then along came Edward Snowden. And we realized there were a few things we had overlooked. Um, but that's how we began. And uh, at our outset was a belief that the public needs to be engaged in how technology impacts their lives 
privacy is a critical issue. We disagree about it on many key points, but nonetheless, we must have that debate. And it's with this background that I want to tell you a bit this morning about a very significant change that Epic undertook after the 2016 presidential election in the United States. You might have heard about that election. The outcome, I think, was a little bit surprising. Um, we were genuinely concerned and I was genuinely concerned because in January I was invited to an off-the-record meeting with the U.S. head, the director of national intelligence, uh, who brought together a few uh, privacy and civil liberties uh, leaders and said, I believe we have a problem. There are questions about this election. I'll be leaving my job soon. He had been working for President Obama. Uh, but I think you're going to need to take a closer look at this. And when you have a meeting like that with somebody like that, your immediate thought is, we probably need to focus. And of course, if you're in the US and if you're in Washington and if you're a lawyer, your next thought is, and we probably need to sue somebody. <laughs> Which is the next thing we did. In fact, we sued precisely that office. We sued the Office of the Director of National Intelligence because in the middle of January of 2017, Mr. Clapper had released a redacted report prepared with information from the various intelligence agencies on the theme of Russian meddling with the 2016 election. And there was a lot of discussion in the report about the multi-pronged attack that the Russians had lost, launched on US democratic institutions. Now this wasn't just about changing votes in election tabulation systems. And I know sometimes when people talk about assaults on democratic institutions in our technological age, their first thought is, well, did they change the vote numbers? I mean, did we end up electing someone that didn't accurately reflect the number of votes that was cast? And I'll say frankly, Right now, the evidence on that point is no. It doesn't appear that the vote tabulations were altered. But that's only the first question you ask. Because it turns out there were a wide variety of techniques that were deployed, including access to social media platforms and advertising and the creation of troll farms and bots that actively engaged in political dialogue as if they were US voters aligned with one candidate, when in fact they were people and machines elsewhere simply participating in debate to provoke, which is a very interesting phenomenon, something we had not previously, dis not previously been disclosed. Mr. Clapper releases his report in January 2017. It's about 13 pages long. It's been cleared for review by the public and we sue his office, the Office of Director of National Intelligence, and we say the public has the right to know the full extent of the Russian interference with the 2016 presidential election. And then we do a little bit more digging, and we learn that in the realm of cybersecurity, the US Federal Bureau of Investigation has primary responsibility to safeguard US organizations, businesses, political groups that are targeted by foreign adversaries. And our next question is, did the FBI actually do what it was supposed to do in response to a threat from a foreign adversary during the election system? That's lawsuit number two. We sue the FBI. Did they actively assist? Did they warn organizations? Did they tell them to check their security? Because they had knowledge of the attack while it was going on. Or did they just leave voicemail? You know, we've got something for you, give us a call back, you might be interested. One of those messages, we wanted to know. Third case Epic brought was against the IRS. We actually wanted the public release of the president's tax returns. Now this is where things got really interesting. People said, well, you're a privacy organization, aren't you? I mean, we know you don't like the president, but is it right for a privacy organization actually to be suing for the public release of his tax records? 
Now I have to say frankly, I don't know what the traditions are in Nordic countries with regard to the tax returns of public officials. But I will say that in the United States for more than 40 years, every person who has run for president has made their tax records publicly available for the simple reason that we really can't evaluate or understand what incentives might be guiding a political leader if we don't know what financial relations he or she might have. President Trump was actually the first candidate for political office in the modern era who chose not to disclose his tax returns. And we thought, well, there's something about that that doesn't seem quite right. And if you go back to the famous American uh, privacy scholar, later Supreme Court Justice, Louis Brandeis, you'll actually see in the article, the famous article, everybody cites it, the Right to Privacy, 1890 Harvard Law Review. What is the very first exception that Brandeis proposes to the right to privacy in that article? And the answer is the right to know about issues concerning public officials, people who would represent us. We actually get to know a little bit more about their private life than we were, would of a private citizen. So as a privacy organization, we defended our lawsuit for the release of President Trump's tax returns, partly because his behavior was so unusual in American tradition, and partly because we thought it was consistent with the modern right to privacy that we know more about public officials. Now I've described for you three lawsuits. EPIC versus Office of Director of National Intelligence, EPIC versus FBI, and now EPIC versus IRS. All of these are campaigns intended to ensure transparency. And as many of you know, privacy and transparency are truly two sides of the same coin. We pursue both equally. In fact, some would argue the paradox of privacy is the enormous value of transparency, which makes possible accountability. But there's one more lawsuit I need to tell you about. And this one we didn't plan. This one came upon us. One of the other issues in the 2016 presidential election, at least according uh, to our president, was the issue of voter fraud. And you may know that under the US electoral system, you can lose the majority of popular votes and still be elected president if you gain a majority of the electoral college, which is to say each of the 50 states allocate so many votes in the selection of the president. And if you get the right arrangement of those state votes to equal 270 or more of the 538 votes that are cast by the states, you become president, even if, as was true in the 2016 race, um, Mr. Trump lost by more than 3 million votes to Secretary Clinton. Uh, president Trump said that, in fact, there had been errors in the voting system, that, in fact, he had a majority of the vote, but there were a lot of votes that weren't properly counted and duplicate votes. And it's a very interesting contention, which is widely disputed in the United States. We actually did not participate in that debate, but this is where it got interesting. President Trump said, well, we need to have a commission and we need to investigate the 2016 election. And we need to determine, in fact, what the actual vote count was. So he created a commission uh, chaired by his vice president, Mr. Pence, and led by a state secretary from the state of Kansas, a close personal friend. And he said to this commission, uh, please let's determine what actually happened in 2016. Okay, it's very unusual to create a commission for this purpose, very controversial purpose. But here is the greatest controversy almost the first thing the commission decided to do was to contact state election officials and say, please send to us all of your state voter records. We'd like to compile all the state voter records 
and see if there are any errors, duplications, other problems that need to be resolved. And again, I'm not directly familiar with the experience in the Nordic countries, but I will tell you in the United States, the elections by the states for the president falls within the province of the states. And it's actually very important to our federal form of government that that power is distributed. And the state election officials for many years have done a great deal to guard the privacy of voter records. I was actually involved in a case almost 25 years ago where we challenged the practice of making the um, social security number publicly available in the state voter rolls. And we actually succeeded when a federal court said that it was simply improper to make that uh, record identifier publicly available. It would undermine the right to privacy. And here we are 25 years later with a controversial commission trying to consolidate all the state voter records. And they did something very clever. They said, but please provide to us only the publicly available information. We know there are all these privacy people out there. They're probably going to file a lawsuit. We only want the publicly available information. And I thought, boy, that's a very clever way to describe what they're doing. It's clever, first of all, because the records that are in the state record systems are all subject to privacy protection in all 50 states. There are circumstances under which they may be disclosed. If you're running for public office, for example, you'll need access to the state voter records so you can contact them. That makes sense. But as a general matter, we actually don't think of voter records being publicly available. That's one half of the equation. The other half of the equation is that in the United States, if you're a federal agency and you request personally identifiable information, you are required by law to undertake a privacy impact assessment prior to the collection of the data. And you actually have to do that to ensure that the record management system that you're proposing to use provides adequate privacy and security. And the commission had not undertaken a privacy impact assessment. They simply wrote to the 50 states, said, turn over all the state voter data, and we'll try to figure out what happened in the election. Did I mention we sued the commission? Okay, <laughs> that happens next. Epic versus Presidential Advisory Commission on Election Integrity the Vice President Michael Pence and a few other people. I am not going to be invited to the White House Christmas party this year. I've made peace with that. It's an important case and we actually won the first round. After uh, we filed our suit, brought attention to the fact that there was no privacy impact assessment, noted that they were actually storing the data a little bit of Orwellian uh, dimension here on a server called SAFE, which in fact was not SAFE because it was not certified explicitly to so store personal data. Not that they hadn't done a privacy impact assessment, they actually had a server with the opposite certification, as in don't per put personal data here. That's where they told the state election officials to send the personal data. And we had that in our lawsuit. That got out and uh, they suspended the program. And then we had an argument before a judge. They said, well, we're gonna make some changes. We're gonna put it on a more safe, safe server and things will be okay. And the judge said, well, okay, but what about the privacy impact assessment? Aren't you still required to do that? And the government responded, well, in fact, we're not really a federal agency. We might look like a federal agency, but you know, it's just a bunch of people getting together. I think, what are they playing cards? Are they bowling? I mean, this strikes me as a federal agency. Obviously, it's a term of art in this context, what constitutes an agency and whether a presidential commission is in fact subject to the obligations that would normally be the case for a federal agency. We think the law is fairly well settled on that point. The judge wasn't so certain as a temporary matter, she ruled in the commission's favor. We've appealed that and toward the end of November, we'll actually be arguing before the Court of Appeals precisely that issue. They resumed the data collection. 
there were hearings in Congress, there have been political protests across the United States. There are now about 15 related cases, various organizations including the ACLU and the Lawyers Committee and Common Cause and Public Citizen and all the good NGOs in the US have brought similar suits against the commission. And it will be interesting to see what happens. But I wanted to end this morning with this um, thought, having uh, shared with you some of our recent activities at Epic and also highlighted some of our related work. Happy to talk about the Equifax breach. I want to say, by the way, on the Equifax breach, you know, everybody does what they can to bring public attention to the importance of privacy protection. So I want to congratulate the European Union for the uh, GDPR and the implementation that's coming ahead. I think that's our great, that's great. On the US side, we're contributing the Equifax data breach, which is the loss of 145 million records to the ongoing public debate about the importance of data protection. So we're trying to do our part as well. That's, that's really all I wanted to say on that. But I think the larger point is this. When we think about privacy protection, we think not only about the rights of individuals as consumers, as citizens, the obligations of organizations, as businesses or government agencies. I think we also think about a right that takes place within a democratic society that actually helps sustain democratic society. And we fully respect that on many of these issues, there are going to be ranges of opinion some people will say, for example, well, you know, the consumer groups, I mean, they may have a point about those smart watches. Maybe they're not so well designed. Maybe we can do a better job. But actually, you know, losing track of your kids and, and, and kidnapping, I mean, those are real issues and we need to find some solutions. And maybe at some point in the future, we'll find some better technological solution to those social challenges. And I think we need all to be open to having that debate in a constructive way with all the expertise on the privacy side and all the energy on the business side to find better solutions. But we need to have that debate in a way in which everyone fully participates and is fully respected. And I have to say, speaking to you toward the end of 2017, less than a year after our presidential election, there's a real concern about the future of democratic institutions in the US. There is a real concern that our traditional understanding that privacy, which is a right for individuals, and transparency, which is an obligation for government leaders, have been increasingly inverted. That it is the voter records of citizens, private citizens, that the government wants access to that is, is the tax records of the president that by tradition would be public are now being kept private. And I think this is an indication of a larger trend. And I'm going to end this morning by suggesting to you, experts in the field of data protection, that you need to keep an awareness of this problem. You need to begin to ask the question, what happens when the rights that we associated for individuals are claimed by government leaders and the obligations of government leaders are placed on individuals. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much, Good. Mark. Um, I've fascinating insight. Let me first by ask, uh, do you feel there is a cultural disconnect between the EU and the US? Do we fundamentally approach privacy differently? Because to me, this idea that you would register as a Democratic voter or a Republican voter, uh, no one has the right to know that about me in my sort of understanding of the world. And yet in the US, this seems the norm. Right. So my view has always been there's much more that's uh, similar between us than sets us apart. And many of the privacy uh, laws in the EU today, the GDPR and the directive, I can trace back to the US in the 1970s and elsewhere and say this is really a common heritage of democratic societies. I think we have a couple of problems in the US. I mean, I think part of the problem is our great enchantment with the internet economy 
uh, led us to believe that it was no longer necessary to have privacy laws. So we turned toward self-regulation, we turned toward multi-stakeholder decision-making. There was a real reluctance to do the hard work of privacy protection with regard to the internet. And the consequence today, of course, is that we lead the world in identity theft, financial fraud, and data breach. Yes? Yeah. So at its heart, I don't think we're that far apart, but I think today we're going down different roads, and I think they're real consequences. One of the areas I see where there is something of a difference is that under EU fundamental charter of rights is that anyone is, is entitled to these rights, no matter where they are, whether they're an EU citizen, whether they're not. And in the US, we have, uh, we have the lovely uh, FISA 702, which means that US citizens are treated differently than the rest of the world. I mean, what's your take on that? What's your advice on, on, on what we in this room should be thinking about? Well, uh, I think the EU got that issue right. Of course, the EU came along a little later, mm -hmm. which is to say uh, the data directive, for example. I mean, this was the rush to 92 and the harmonization of national laws. We did our Privacy Act uh, back in the early 1970s, and I don't think there was even much thought at that time that there would be large record systems containing personal data of non-US citizens. Now, of course, post 9-11, there are travel records and financial records and many records that should be uh, protected under US law. We did a little work on the umbrella agreement to extend some of those protections. I don't think they went uh, far enough. But of course, that expires at the end of this year, so should we all be contacting our uh, representatives to say, put pressure on the US to Well, absolutely, and we've raised those issues, and certainly 702 is a very important uh, legislative debate taking place right now in the US, and there's been, a, I would say, an important coalition. Obviously, the EU governments are concerned about that mass surveillance authority, but the US NGOs are also concerned that even when non-US citizens are targeted under that authority, the practical effect is to catch a lot of data on US citizens. So you have on both sides a push to reform 702. Okay, well finally our topic for today is about new emerging technologies. And so I want you to ask you specifically where you see Epic's work in the future going with regard to AI and machine learning and... Yes. Well, we've been at this, as I said, for quite some time. Uh, I'll just you know, quickly mention, you may see the top item on our news feed uh, this week concerns uh, facial recognition uh, body cameras by the police, right? So how do you do a better job of police accountability? A lot of people said, well, if we have police-worn body cameras, that's one way to do it. We, s we were skeptical. We said this is technology in search of a solution. And in fact, the most comprehensive study ever done uh, came out this week, does not impact police behavior. On AI, a very simple solution. We need to know the basis of the decision making. The two words, algorithmic transparency. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.